Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Sunday Evening Update, the place to get all your news and views about live extension and research from around the world. Yeah, I get to talk to all kinds of uh, researchers and advocates, life extension advocates, from around the globe every week here on Sunday evenings, typically at 6 p.m. Eastern, 2300 GMT. This is the Sunday Evening Update, the most, the greenest, most environmentally friendly broadcast on Ustream. Yes, the studio lit exclusively by LED lighting. I'm Justin Lowe. Thanks for stopping by tonight. We've got a great guest. Of course, we've been promoting it a bit already throughout the week. Dr. VJ Pandey of Stanford University and Folding at Home fame. Yes, he'll be coming up in just a couple of minutes. First, I want to go through a couple of updates. We do have now approved a matching fund. Some of you may have been following this. Uh, one of our members at the Institute has terminal cancer, or I guess very close to it, and uh, we fear that uh, he may uh, meet his untimely death rather soon. So, the Institute did approve an $8,000 matching grant for a chronic suspension at the uh, Cryonics Institute in Michigan. So. I don't know. He does. William, a uh, lifetime member, he, he, I don't know how much time he has left. So if you got five or ten bucks, you can match that money and uh, we can give him an alternative chance at life extension. So be sure to check that out in the Immortality Institute forums. And also, I want to mention that we do have director elections going on. And that's, of course, goes on until February 8th. It's a month-long procedure here. And, of course, only members do vote in the elections because they are like shareholders of the uh, organization. However, everyone can participate in the election process because the candidates' campaign forums are all open to everyone who visits uh, the forum. So you can go and ask questions, you can voice your support and say, hey, if I was a member, I would be voting for you. Uh, so here's a list of the seven people who have accepted nominations for directors. We are voting for four new directors in 2009. So be sure to keep an eye on that. you still got quite a while to vote. In the next couple of weeks, I'll keep reminding you. Now, on to our guest for the evening, who is Dr. Vijay Pandey of Stanford and one of the founders of the Folding at Home Project. Welcome to the broadcast, Dr. Pandey. Hi, thanks for having me. Yes, well, it's great to have you here. And you know what? We had so many questions come in <laughs> uh, throughout the week uh, as far as folding at home goes. I'm going to have to start to get right into it. Uh, I really want to focus on the future of folding at home, the science and the technical aspects behind it. But first, how about, uh, could you say, uh, give me a little bit about the history of folding at home. I know, I believe it started in uh, 2000 and it seems like it's, you know, since I've been following it, it's been all clear sailing, smooth sailing ever since the beginning. But uh, what's been the, the biggest challenge over the last eight years? I think there's been lots of challenges in different categories. I think a lot of the challenges that people don't hear about, I think, are the challenges of how to use all these computers in a really efficient way. And that's a, you know, a very technical thing and something that I've talked about in lots of scientific talks and scientific papers, but um, you know, I think the face of folding at home is what people see when they run it. You know, the real question, like any distributed computing project, is how can you turn all those computers into something that's really useful? Uh-huh, right. Uh, and the, uh, as far as your expertise in the folding at home, I've seen you speak a couple of times on the project. Is yours more of the biochemical background or more of the computing background, your contribution? Um, my contribution is pretty broad because being the sort of director, I sort of have to um, be in charge of all of the aspects uh. from the low-level coding of, of uh, you know, GPU coding or uh, server coding or, you know, ops or, but then to sort of more biophysical questions and then on to directing uh. the experimental portions of the test. So, um, you know, I, for me it's exciting because, you know, it's neat to be able to work with people with skills in such a broad range of things. Um, right. So, so, so it's, it's sort of all over the place. Okay. 
Uh, and I see uh, recently that you did post in the forum some uh, potentially exciting preliminary results identifying some small molecules that m might be used uh, to treat Alzheimer's or help treat Alzheimer's at some point in the future. Uh, and I just and I know that you're also focusing on lipid vesicles and um, uh, uh, viral infection. Now, what other things, now, I, I mean, let's just speculate, in the next couple of years, a lot more computing power comes on, on online uh, for you. What other types of, of uh, diseases or other type of, uh, uh, you know, health conditions are, have, have you thought about in the last, uh, you know, in the last couple of years that you might be able to a address? Yeah, so I think, you know, so Alzheimer's has been very much on our minds for a long time, and as we're starting to see some successes there, one of the hopes we have is that we'll be able to apply the techniques that we've been using with Alzheimer's to other areas. And so one of the first areas that we'll probably apply it to is Huntington's disease. And okay. there's uh, sort of some pilot preliminary projects going on there. Uh, another area that's uh, already become, I think, a great interest of ours is understanding um, viral uh, infection, especially influenza. And, you know, uh, there's a slide that actually I show... Um, a lot of my talks when I talk about viral infection and influenza is that if you plot life expectancy versus time, um, you know, going from, let's say, 1900 to 2000, it's gradually going up and up and up, except for this huge drop in 1918. Oh, right. Um, where it dropped maybe like 10 years or 15 years. It went from maybe uh, 55 to 40 or something like that. And, you know, that's a dramatic change in life expectancy. And, of course, that came, was due to this 1918 pandemic. And one of the things that I think would be really exciting to think about if we had, you know, 10 times as much computing power, if we were more like 50 petaflops rather than 5 petaflops, is to think what types of things not can we just solve, but could we solve quickly. Okay. And I think in the case of a pandemic is where being able to give um, information very quickly could be of great use. Sure, yeah, and uh, I guess with uh, more petaflops, you'd be able to uh, do a lot more simulations, I mean, a lot quicker, uh, figuring that out. What, on, on the uh, topic of uh, Alzheimer's disease, uh, there are many other type of plaques that build up in the body, and viewers of this show are particularly interested in uh, longevity research, life extension research, and uh, perhaps you're aware of advanced uh, glycation end products, uh, 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 glucosapan and other plaques and other uh, junk that builds up in the body. Uh, any plans? Have, has anyone, any researchers out there approached you about uh, some of these aspects of uh, health and disease? Well, one thing I think uh, I think it's true for us and it's true for a lot of people is that it's hard to make very broad contributions with and still have them be deep. Mm -hmm. And so I've been trying to concentrate on one area uh, so far, Alzheimer's, where we could really try to make a significant contribution. Um, so I, I should admit that my uh, knowledge in some of the other areas is just very sort of uh, um, preliminary and very okay. basic. So I mean, one, one of the interesting and deep questions is whether the types of plaque buildup in Alzheimer's is something that is a generic effect, that when we look at all these other proteins for them diseases, are they all related in some way? Or uh, is everyone different? Yeah, and that, I think this yeah. is going to be a big challenge. And my guess is that they're all different. Yeah, I, I, my guess is that as well, that they're all different. I was just wondering, perhaps there are uh, enough similarities between uh, Alzheimer's and plaques uh, that cause uh, diseases of the brain and other, uh, you know, misfolded proteins and plaques that occur elsewhere in the body. Uh, so anyway, I'm hopeful that uh, perhaps folding at home uh, in the future might be able to delve into some of those things. And we did have a, a question from the audience that came through, and it, it kind of uh, goes with one of the questions on my list. Um, I, it has to do with some of the technical aspects of it, and that is, uh, was asked, whether or not you're working with Microsoft to have folding as a built-in program in Windows, such as it was built into PS3, perhaps NVIDIA could build it into their, uh, you know, somehow build it into their uh, GPUs, uh, things like that. Uh, are you working with any other companies like you did with PS3 and Sony? Yeah, we, we are definitely looking into various possibilities like that. I think I should mention right now that uh, Folding Home ships with all ATI graphics cards. It and does. we're working to do something. Uh, yeah, so 